morning, everyone. Much better. Uh, welcome to Morning Star Church. And I uh, have a few announcements for you. I'm not going to go over the regularly scheduled events that happen every week, but uh, today starts a Care Net uh, Baby Bottle Fundraiser. And uh, there's one of these flower flyers out in the off lobby there, and you'll see a bunch of little baby bottles. And they are asking you to put your change, your dollar bills, your checks, whatever, in that. And uh, this fundraiser goes until Father's Day. So if you would pick those up today and uh, fill it up and bring it back by, by your Father's Day. And if you do put a check in it, they're asking if you would write that out payable to CareNet IRC. Um, we have a marriage date night coming up this Friday, May 19th, and it's going to be uh, 6.30 in front of Riverside Theater. Um, they're asking to bring your own chairs. Anything else I need to comment about that? No, yeah, it's going to be available for purchase. Okay. All right. And then on Saturday, uh, we have a ladies' pool party at uh, Ann Kellen's house from 11.15 to 2. Any other thing you want to bring out, Ann? No, it's time for your suit if you want to swim or not, but um, float is fine. All right. And then the Sebastian River Cruise, uh, put that on your calendar for June 10th. And um, there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby for that. And also for the pool party, I believe, there's a sign-up sheet out there. It is a pot lot, so just, you know, if you go, anybody Okay. And then uh, next Sunday is the third Sunday luncheon. Um, just a reminder, have I left out any announcements or anything? All right, Dennis, would you come up and give us a call to worship? Trevor's on vacation, so you're stuck with me, which is uh, fine. I like that. So anyways, why don't we stand and let's do the call to worship. It's in your bulletin here. I'll read the first part, and then you guys jump in. From Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary. May he give you from Zion. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions.
pray together. <coughs> Father, we come together here to, um, to worship you. We are a, a needy people. And as the song said, we find strength to face the day in Christ. And uh, in your fears, or in, our, in your presence, our fears uh, go away. And uh, so you are the almighty God. You are the alpha and the omega. And our hope is in you. So we thank you that we can worship you this morning. And uh, as we come together, we, we must admit, Father, our failings before you, things uh, done, things left undone, attitudes. We confess these to you, Lord. We uh, pray that you would cleanse us and uh, restore us to that uh, fellowship with you, Lord. We ask that everything we do here, um, just uh, singing our fellowship, the breaking of the word to us, Lord, that you would uh, it just be a, a worship of you, we pray in your son's name. Amen. Our next song is an old hymn. Um, Elizabeth Hewitt wrote this in the late 1800s. Uh, she was in, incapacitated with a spinal problem and used her time to write poems. And uh, 100 years, over 100 years later, we're still singing the lyrics <laughs> of the poem. So it just shows you how God can use someone in their infirmity, right? So let's sing. My faith is found in rest. Let's sing the King of Glory.
reading this morning comes from the book of Zechariah near the end of the Old Testament in uh, chapter 13 if you are using one of the black pew Bibles you'll find it on page 799 this is a prophecy in the Old Testament many hundreds of years before Christ was born saying that God's servant would suffer this is one of the many prophecies we have from the Old Testament that talk about that not only that he would suffer, this, the, the, the subheading here is called The Shepherd is Struck. And what will happen to the Lord's people when that time comes? Uh, Pastor Dennis is going to be preaching today from the book of Luke, chapter 21, where Jesus foretells the destruction of Jerusalem many years later. So Zechariah, chapter 13, verses 7 through 9, this is the word of the Lord. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested they will call upon my name and i will answer them i will say they are my people and they will say the lord is my god may god bless the reading of his word <coughs> Good 
have the offering in the back for you, back there in the corner, that little white box, and we hope you'll take advantage of it. Um, I can say this, uh, since I don't get a salary here, um, I can say that I, you ought to be good givers. That's one of the things that we should be as Christians and uh, part of our walking with Christ. So uh, please um, test the Lord in this. It's one of the few things that the Lord says, test me in. And, um, we have found over and over again, my wife and I, that when we have given our 10% or more to the Lord, that he has been more than faithful to help us. We have eight kids, if you can believe that, and every single one of them uh, got to go to college and all those things on a pastor's salary. Uh, and I wasn't getting much. Um, not here, I'm talking about somewhere. So it was a real, real blessing uh, to be able to see God work. And he will work in your life in the same way, too, if we're faithful to him to show our honor to him. Um, we're going to sing the doxology. Would you stand with me, please? opportunity to do a children's sermon today if we have any children. Any children? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Hi guys. How are you today? Good? You good? All right. We're going to have some fun today. Do you guys know about fire alarms? Hmm? If there's a fire and you hear a ding, 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 and a bell, what are you supposed to do? Do you know? What? Uh, you run after them in your house. That's right, you do. And if you were in school or daycare or something like that and you heard a fire alarm, ding, 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 where do you go? Run. Yes, you run. You run out of the building. And you go to a place where everybody's all together. You gather together so that your teachers and your adults can make sure that everybody's there, right? I wonder if we had a fire alarm, what we should do. Oh, come on, come on, let's go. Everybody, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. fire alarm, fire alarm. Go <laughs> that way, go that way, keep going. You want me to come with? Oh, that's all right. I'm going to go. That's all right, he's too scared. <laughs> all right. Will we steal my kids? Uh, a few. You have others, sir. <laughs> They're coming back here. Now, what was the whole point of the fire alarm? Anybody know? No, of course you don't, because I made it up. All right. Um, do we have a fire alarm for us? Yes. Well, what are you thinking about? You mean, you mean for, for the building? We do. We do have one for the building. And so if we had one for the building, everybody would hear it and we'd all go where? Outside. Outside. We rush outside. We find the nearest exit. Where are exits? There's an exit there. It's actually one there, but you can't see the exit sign. And then there's one back there when you come in. And then there's one out the kitchen, right? So we got four places that we could really go if we needed to. But you know what I want to talk about? Is I want to talk about the fire alarm that happens to all Christians. Anybody knows, know when that happens? Jesus' is second coming. There's actually a fire alarm. How do we know that he's going to be coming? Yeah, there's a trumpet sound. Okay? Now, I don't know if that'll be a shofar, a shofar? Shofar. You know, it could be like that. Or if it's gonna be one of the silver trumpets like they had in Temple 2, which would be more like a, what? Or something, probably lower than that, in some way. 
But there'll be that trumpet sound that we're told about. They're told about this in uh, Thessalonians. So when Jesus comes, listen for a trumpet sound, okay? And then there's going to be something else that happens. Just like your parents would say, let's go, let's go. Come on, come on, come on. We're going to have an angel that says that too, do you know? There's an archangel. What's an arch mean? A boat. A boat. It does mean a boat. This is a different kind of arch, which means chief angel. Big, big, big. Yeah, big, 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 big. So the archangel's going to do what? Shout! I wonder what a shout. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeshua is coming! Right? That's a Hebrew word for Jesus. I would think he'd speak Hebrew, wouldn't you? So, Yeshua is coming, and we're going to hear that. We're going to hear the trumpet, and then Jesus is going to appear. Are you looking forward to that? How about you guys? Are you looking forward to Jesus coming? Yes. That's good. And now you've also practiced a fire alarm, so if we ever do have a fire here, you know what to do, right? Yes. Okay, good. Bye, bye, bye. We'll see you. You can go back to your seats now. <laughs> Today we get the chance to look at some scripture, which uh, we'll be turning to Luke 21 in a minute, uh, and I'll, I'll read it as we kind of go through the sermon. Um, let me kind of set things up for you, at least the way I've been thinking about this, because I don't like doing sermons that I don't apply to myself, and this is something I've been thinking about quite a bit before Trevor even asked me about uh, doing the sermon. Um, I can uh, be somebody who gets obsessed about things, and uh, when it comes to news, bad news in particular, I can really get kind of fretting and worrying about things. Um, and I think things were pretty good until we kind of came up to the whole COVID thing. And it wasn't the COVID was so terrible as it was everything else that went along with it, in my opinion, that was so terrible. And um, it was it been a very, very difficult time since 2020, and maybe earlier for you, but you know, 2020. I keep uh, thinking, well, maybe things will get a little better. And um, in my opinion, I just find more things to worry about. Uh, so if you'll pray with me, and then we'll look at some things that you can worry about too. <laughs> Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you that for your word, which comforts us. And we thank you that it's not just a set of words on a page or even commands. It's the story about you. And that as we see how you've acted in the past, we can know that you are the same God for us presently now. So we pray that you will amaze us again from your scripture this morning. And Lord, we think of our pastor too, uh, Trevor. We think of Melissa and the kids, and we ask that you are blessing them, refreshing them, uh, giving them great encouragement, keeping them healthy, uh, giving them good visits and wonderful times in nature and together. Build them together as a family. And bring our pastor back to us so that we indeed might benefit from his wonderful shepherding, his care, and his deep love for us. And continue to pour your love and your wisdom into his heart. And so these elders, Lord, too, who support him and who care for him deeply, we pray that you would continue to keep them in the palm of your hand in faith, always growing more and more to be like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I do want to say just a moment too that I, I really am so grateful to Trevor. I used to be the pastor here, and it's not every pastor that allows the previous pastor to remain here. Um, and he has been so gracious to allow me to do that for Sue and I, and for us to continue to make this our home. And um, it's been really, really wonderful. So I just want to say that about Trevor. Well, let's talk about some things that I worry about. Okay. The uh, whole COVID thing and stuff was pretty worrisome to me. I really, really hated the fact that we were cut off from other people, that we couldn't meet together as a church for a period of time, things like that. That bothered me a lot, and I hope that things will get better. 
And uh, then I just found more things to worry about. So let's go ahead and talk about this. Uh, yeah, beginning of this year, we had this, uh, or last year, we, we uh, had this war that began, and it really has consumed a lot of my thoughts, and, you know, even though it's very, very far away. Um, and it's not just the money of over $100 billion that's been pledged by the United States, but it's, it's so much more. It's could, the fact that it could grow and develop, and it just keeps escalating. It's almost like an escalate, escalating elevator that nobody wants to get off. So I worry a little bit about that. And then there's this that I worry about too, if you click next. Um, we've gotten bank failures. Now I thought after just a few bank failures, things would be okay. I mean, we've been reassured that the whole financial system is, um, what is it, secure and resilient? Or what's the, what's the mantra that everybody keeps saying? It's almost like they're in the same script, right? And, uh, and yet, People are telling us, like the professor here in Stanford, that there are half of the banks that are insolvent, and there could be many, many more that kind of have this financial crash. Well, I'm not looking forward to that. And then there's this. Are we going into a recession or a depression, or are we already in one, or what's going on? Uh, click again. If you would. There's this guy named Michael Berry, who, uh, Burry, who, he was the one who um, is the movie about the great short. I don't know if you ever saw that one, but he's the one who predicted the crash in 2008, uh, the great financial collapse. And so he's predicting that we're actually moving into a depression. Are you getting depressed yet? Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> and then there's this thing coming up is the, uh, I don't know if you heard about CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. They want to take all of our money and already it's in digits, but they want to control the money in the central bank, uh, which eventually would become a world bank. And these are all plans that have been laid out by the global elite. And uh, then you will only be able to buy and sell with your money uh, using um, you know, the, what they started out to call FedCoin. You can actually go out and uh, look up FedCoin, and you'll go to the website, and they'll tell you that it's a January start date uh, on this. Now, um, they're not going to immediately abolish cash or anything like that. You still have your bank accounts, but slowly but surely, I'm wondering if we're not the frog in the kettle, getting read, uh, ready to um, you know, have the global elite kind of control everything that we do, buy and sell, because your social credit score is supposed to be locked in with your, uh, your bank account that you'll have with the Fed. Um, that does not sound good to me. Does that sound good to you for somebody telling you what you can buy and sell and all that? And then there's this guy, too, uh, Klaus Schwab, who's the head of the World Economic Forum, and he says that we'll own nothing and we will be happy by the year 2030. <laughs> <laughs> now, lest you think that these are just some fringe elements, um, the United Nations has actually signed up with this dude in the World Economic Forum to make this a reality in 2030. Go ahead and click again if you would. And, and then there's World War, which, is, which could all start. World War III, and uh, four different areas probably that, that could start in. India versus Pakistan, Russia versus the US, China versus the US, or Iran versus the US. You see that us seems to be much in there somehow. <laughs> I'm not sure how us got so much in there. And, and then there's this one uh, too, uh, which is actually Luke, the scripture. Because I began to ask myself, uh, were I'm, am I the only person who ever is worried about things and had bad times and been in a bad time uh, uh, period? And surely we're not. There have been many, many people who have faced very, very similar kinds of things. They you know digital currencies and things like that, but, but they faced hardship. They faced the loss of their goods and their home. They faced war. They faced where am I going to get my food? How am I going to protect my kids? That's one of the big things I worry about is what can I do to help my family uh, and all and keep them secure and safe in some way. They worry about their leadership, which in those days was appointed rather than elected, so we, they didn't even have that privilege, and they're concerned. And Christians were concerned about those things too. If you turn with me to Luke 21, I just want to read a few verses. You may remember this uh, passage as being... Um, something that appears in the other Gospels, uh, if you would. It's um, in Matthew 24. 
It's also in Mark, where Jesus talks about the temple being destroyed and eventually talks about a second coming. But I just want to focus on the temple being destroyed part. Not many people realize that um, Jesus included a lot of different things in his Olivet Discourse. We say Olivet because it was done on the Mount of Olives. And he was up there with his disciples, and his disciples were enamored by the Jewish temple. It was the largest it had ever been. Herod had spent a huge, huge amount of money um, on the temple. What in today would be billions and billions of dollars. And it literally was the greatest religious um, edifice building complex in the whole Roman Empire, and that was said by Romans themselves. So that's how beautiful it was, and it was a big deal. And so the uh, disciples say, hey, look at these beautiful stones, and what does Jesus come back and say? Yeah, they're so beautiful, isn't this a wonderful temple? What do you say? <laughs> yeah, there's not gonna be one stone left on another in a matter of a few years. Within a generation, you're not going to even see that temple exist anymore. I think that took the disciples back a little bit. And he went on to predict, you know, that they're going to have persecutions, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars and all that, and that's going to go on for a number of years, in the next generation, 40 years. And then he goes on and speaks very specifically about the destruction of Jerusalem. So we're going to start in Luke 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are at the country enter back into the city, for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Vengeance against whom? When Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, it was God's judgment on the Jews. You may remember that Jesus wept as he was coming into Jerusalem before this, and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I longed to take you under my arms, but you would have none of it. And so in their sin and their rejection of the Messiah, it was postponed for a whole generation, but after that point, the hardness of the Jews had come in, and uh, about two-thirds of the Jewish population that we know of were, did not convert over to believing that Jesus was their Messiah. We think in terms of general, there was about one-third did that were willing, and we, they would, we would call them today Messianic Jews. And so many of these were living in Jerusalem because that was the place where Jesus had died. That's the place where the strongest church was, the Jerusalem church. So these Jewish believers were living there. Uh, this, of course, would be in the future from when Jesus is talking. And then he, uh, he says... For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Verse 23. Alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Why? Yeah, it's hard enough, right? I mean, you're taking care of little kids and worrying about little kids and all that, and now you've got destruction of the city happening. Well, what's going on? Or even if you're going to flee, it's going to be a problem, isn't it? Taking your kids and not being able to go back into the city and get anything, you're gonna lose everything. See what I'm saying? Don't pick up anything, don't waste your time, get out. So everything that has to be left behind, your house and your home and your goods, uh, maybe you can grab a few shekels, I don't know, but you're gonna to have to leave relatives who are unbelievers too behind and never, never see them again in this life. Alas for the women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be a great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword, speaking to the Jewish people, and be led captive among all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And then later on, Jesus goes on and talks about his second coming, which is subsequent to, of course, this. Um, Click, if you would, please, again. The fall of Jerusalem happened in AD 70. Do you mind a little history? Um, uh, the fall of Jerusalem happened in AD 70, and it was one of the most horrific things that have ever happened, possibly the most horrific incident that ever happened. Um, there was a war that began back in 68 AD against the Romans. 
There was a group called the Zealots. Do you remember one of the disciples who's actually a Zealot? Okay, and the Zealots like to go around and they get, like to take um, their short swords, hide them in their togas, and then go up to Roman officials and stick them in the back. Uh, one of the things they did. But they also raised armies and had militias and things like that. And so eventually, because of the Roman occupation and the way the Jews felt offended by all that, and we won't go into all that, but they actually rose up. And they uh, started up in Galilee is where the whole thing started. The Roman legions came in and they defeated what was up in Galilee. And then they came down to Judea to, and you remember in Judea, what's the capital of, of the nation at that point? Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem is the capital of the Jews. And so they had actually set up their capital in Jerusalem at that point because they had rebelled and they declared their independence and, and all. And they were so strongly believing that God would defend their Jewish cause that it was Passover time. So all of them went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover as an act of faithfulness. Three million Jews were in Jerusalem when the Roman legion showed up and closed them in. And then Josephus, who is a Jewish historian and actually was with Titus's army, Titus was the general at that point, um, and later, then later became an emperor of Rome. But Titus, uh, he, uh, Josephus describes in detail exactly what it was like. Because uh, Jerusalem had very, very strong and thick walls and it took a long time for, for the Romans to actually beat down the walls and to get in. And so there was starvation. There were rival groups that began fighting one another in Jerusalem. It was a terrible situation. Some tried to escape and they tried to take their goods with them. They would swallow diamonds and things like that. Well, the Roman soldiers picked up on that. And so they began to capture these people as they were coming out of Jerusalem. You can imagine what they did to get the diamonds and stuff out. And the horrific stories of crucifixions and other things that happened during this time it really was really a terrible, terrible situation. But if you would again, what about the Jewish Christians though? We have three records from the early church time that tell us what happened to the Messianic believers in Jerusalem. All the disciples went to live in a place called Pella because Christ had told them to leave Jerusalem. Where? In the part we just read in Luke 21. Um, and to go away since it would undergo a siege. It's one of the guys that talks about that. Now, um, Click again, if you would, and this is from Eusebius of Caesarea. He wrote a whole church history, and um, one of the things he has in the church history is the people of the church in Jerusalem were commanded by an oracle given by revelation before the war to those in the city who were worthy of it, meaning believers. They were commanded to depart and to dwell in one of the cities called Pella. Those who believed on Christ traveled from Jerusalem, the royal capital of the Jews. If you click one more time, I want to talk a little bit about Pella, where they went. Can you see Pella over there? It's on the east side of the Jordan River. There's that blue line. And Pella is one of those that's kind of in pink purple. Can you see it? Right there, a little bit close up. You got it? Yeah. Pella. That's Pella. Now, some interesting things about Pella. Let's click one. Um, it's part of an area called the Decapolis. Uh, Deca means ten in, in Latin, polis, city, okay? It's the area of the ten cities, and the ones that are all in uh, purple, pink, um, are actually the ten cities and the names of them that are there. One's Philadelphia, this is a different Philadelphia from, from the one in um, Pennsylvania, and it's also different from the one in Asia Minor, okay? But uh, Philadelphia, uh, Gerasa, Gadara, Hippus, Dion, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, all that, okay? Let's click again if you would. This was pagan Gentile territory over here. This had been, uh, centuries before, had been uh, settled by Alexander the Great. And there was a big, big deal about pagan worship and worshiping the Greek gods and the Roman gods over here. So why in the world would the Jews go there? To a pagan area. Click again. Uh, Pella hated the Jews because at the start of the Jewish war, 
the Jewish zealots had actually ransacked and destroyed Pella to begin their revolt. So if you were a citizen of Pella, how do you think you would feel about Jewish people? No way are they coming here. No way would we accept Jews. Like you again, if you would, though. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 5, if you would, and we're just going to glance over a few verses. This is the last passage I'll ask you to look at. You still with me? Okay. Sorry if I'm too detailed. I like doing history and stuff, so just a different style. Mark. Mark chapter 5. Now, you know this story well, so I'm going to glance over it, but it's uh, the healing, if you want to put it that way, the um, um, the relief, the uh, ex, ex, how do you say it? Ex, exorcism of the demoniac. Um, Matthew tells us there were actually two, but Luke and Mark just focus on the one who's the chief speaker and has a future and, um, that they, we know about. So, I want you to note that uh, back in chapter 4, <coughs> verse 35, there's a little thing that goes on in the uh, Synoptic Gospels that really will help clue you into some things. On the Sea of Galilee, there was a Jewish side to the Sea of Galilee, which was in the eastern part, east of the Sea of Galilee. Then there was a pagan side to the Sea of Galilee, which was the western part where the Decapolis was, where all those Greek cities were. And one side did not normally function with the other side. On the one side, you ate kosher. On the other side, you had pigs. All right? On the one side, you had synagogues. On the other side, you had pagan temples. On the one side were the Jews. On the other side were people that hated the Jews. But look what Jesus does. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, I'm Mark uh, 4, verse 35, let us go across to the other side. Now, when you see other side, that's very significant. And you... They've got to highlight that because that's telling you that he's moving not just location, he's moving from uh, either um, Jewish territory to pagan territory or pagan territory back to Jewish territory. And to trace that, it helps you out a lot. Now let's go down to chapter 5. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerizines. I think we saw one of the names there, um, one of the cities. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out, he was cutting himself with stones. So is this guy redeemable? Is he healable? <laughs> Can we get him uh, into a 12-step program and get this taken care of? Can we put him in a mental institution for a while and deal with it with drugs? No, because there's a whole legion of demons that is inside him. And when Jesus saw from afar, saw him from afar, or, I'm sorry, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran to Jesus and fell down before him and cried out with a loud voice. And he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Now, that's really interesting. He instantly knew who Jesus was. And he also knew something that the disciples were still learning. And so were the Jewish people that he was the son of God, the most high God. I adjure you by God. Do not torment me. Isn't it interesting that he's swearing by God in order to get Jesus not to? Do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What's your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a great herd of pigs. Remember, it was pagan territory, non-kosher. And they were feeding on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs. Uh, let us enter into them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered into the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. Now, we don't need to go into detail about that because I'm not preaching on the passage, but it definitely shows to people who are living in the area that something's happened to this man, right? And the unclean has become clean, including even the pigs who are dead. 
The herdsmen fled and told in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened, and they came to Jesus and saw the um, demon-possessed man and the floating barbecue. The one who had the legion, he was sitting there, and he was clothed, and he was in his right mind, and they were afraid. I bet. I bet you the disciples were pretty <laughs> taken back by this, too. Um, and those who had seen him, uh, who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Interesting. Please, please leave. Why? Fear? What's that? It's bad for business. It's bad for business too, isn't it? So we've just lost a bunch of pigs. Not going to be a power. So he began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. And as he, being Jesus, was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him, there's the same word, begged him that he might be with him. So how do you think Jesus is going to respond to that? What do you think would be the next thing that you would read? Hey, I delivered you. You want to follow me? Sure. Right? All I want to do, Jesus, is just be with you. But here's what Jesus does. And it says, and he, meaning Jesus, did not permit him, but said to him, go home. Now that sounds cruel to me. Doesn't it sound cruel to you? Mm -hmm. I think that if I was the demon-possessed man, I would feel very rejected at that point. And I sometimes don't understand what God's doing in my life either. <laughs> I struggle with things, events happen, and I go, what in the world are you doing? This doesn't even follow what I would expect to happen from a God who loves me. A God who wants me to be close to. But he said, go home to your friends, oh, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Isn't that simple? Thanks, say if you would. Look what verse 20 says then. And he, the demon-possessed man, began to, former demon-possessed man, began to proclaim in the what? The Decapolis, what God had done for him. Why did Jesus not want him to go? You're going to be an evangelist here in this whole pagan area. You're going to tell people about me. They're not going to have a lot of contact with me because I'm focusing on the Jews right now. And I'm going to die over there. But you're going to be able to tell what happened to you. And he went through the whole ten cities telling people about Jesus. Do you know what the result of that was? Click the answer would please. Pella had a strong Christian church that welcomed the Messianic brothers and sisters in 70 AD. Now, I look at stuff like that, and I know it's, it's just probably me because I'm really weird, but I go, <laughs> you mean that Jesus, knowing what was going to happen in 70 AD, Back in 30 AD, somewhere around in there, he healed this demon-possessed man, said, you can't come with me, sent him to go evangelize, to prepare a place for the Jewish Christians to go and to live and be safe. <laughs> it's almost like Jesus knew what would happen in the future. It's almost like God was in the future. Now, I'm, I'm, again, maybe just me, but Look, if you would, please. Here's where I have some takeaways. Our God is absolutely awesome and amazing. Amen. He's got it all planned out. Amen. All those little slides I had of all those worries and all that, he's got it in his hand. Now, it's not saying there's not going to be tough times. It's not saying that some of us might actually be martyred and die, because that did happen in Christians. But it means that who holds the future? He holds the future. Who holds you? We're in the palm of Jesus' his hand, and no one so snatch us out. And if that's true, then, if you would, our Father has already planned for our future. In fact, he is already in our future, because God is above time, and he's already got it all taken care of. 
So he sees what the globalist elite, World Economic Forum, and other people are doing, and he's got a plan for all this. Now, maybe that plan is to get us to the second coming. I don't know. Maybe that plan is for us to suffer for a little while. I, I don't know. Maybe that plan is to turn everything that they're doing upside down because he has a way of doing that where the wicked fall into their own traps. Amen. No. But I know that he's got it. And then, next, if we trust God with our eternal security, why shouldn't we trust him with our present circumstances? If I really believe that he's going to take care of me in the future, can't I believe he's going to take care of me and my family now to whatever it is you're dealing with? I mean, your, your things that you're wrestling with probably aren't big global things. They're probably, oh, my back is killing me, or I have to have an operation, or I'm dealing with cancer, or I don't have my finances. Inflation is killing me. I don't know what I'm going to do in terms of being able to, you know, uh, my family is going crazy. You know, I've got an addict uh, for a son. Oh, I could keep it going on, on. But the application is the same. And lastly, and this is where the sermon ends, so thank you for being kind and paying attention. If you are a follower of Christ, you don't have to live at the mercy of present problems and future fears. Christ has got you. Amen. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not trying to do some things to prepare for the future and trying to be wise and things like that. I have to do one of those preppers. But it also means that I can't think that that's going to deal with everything either because <laughs> it won't. They'll find me and my family on my farm up in the mountains somewhere, you know. <laughs> but there's God. There's my Father. He loves and cares for me. He loves and cares for my family. And each of us just needs to grab a hold of that more than we listen to all the news and stuff like that. Make sure you keep reading your Bible because you're going to continue to just kind of be amazed at little things that you find like this throughout the scripture that just blow your mind. And in the end, I think what changes us is not a bunch of commandments and not a knowledge of the scripture, but a knowledge of God and who he is for us. This is the God of the demoniac. This is the God of the apostles. This is the God who rescued people from Jerusalem in 70 AD. This is my God. This is your God. Who still lives, has a future, a hope, and a plan for us. Do you stand with me? Let's close in prayer. Fret not, the scripture says, fret not, fret not. There's that song, I can't remember exactly which one it is, but the fret not song. I like that song. Uh, Lord, uh, help me to really see you and be amazed at you every single day that goes by and not to be captured by the worries of the times in which we live. You are more powerful than anything. You're more powerful and greater than my fears. And if you tell me to worry about anything, you say, just worry about the day. That's enough. Those troubles are enough. So, Lord, that's what I'll do. And we will trust you and be amazed at you and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Hallelujah is actually a Hebrew word that appears in the Psalms, but it has a meaning. It means literally to boast in God, in, in God, to boast in God. So uh, this benediction should remind us to boast in our God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask that we think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations yours, the next one, the next one, however many come, as he has been faithful to us forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. 